Hallelujah. Let's start off in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for the word of God. And we pray even now that you would just take your word and bring it alive to each one of us, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning I want to continue on our series on being a spiritually minded Christian. This is a part seven, how to develop a relationship with God's word. And just as a, a quick summary of what we've been doing for the last number of weeks, as believers, we have a choice. We can be naturally minded, carnally minded, or spiritually minded. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15 says, but the, spirit, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are indeed foolishness to him, for nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is rightly judged by no one. As Christians, we can have a spiritual mind, which is to think the thoughts of God and to see and evaluate circumstances and events from God's perspective, which is both heavenly and eternal. As Christians, we can have a natural mind which sees and evaluates life only from this temporal, physical, earthly perspective. The natural mind sees things only from the natural perspective and either does not acknowledge the existence of the spiritual realm or does not recognize the value or the activities of the spiritual realm. As Christians, we can be carnally minded, which sees and evaluates life only from a purely selfish perspective, seeking to satisfy the fleeting lusts of the flesh, because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The three areas that enable us to develop into spiritually minded Christians are our relationship with the Word of God, prayer, and Christian fellowship. Of the three foundational principles that enable us to develop into spiritually minded Christians, it is the Bible that grounds us in, in the truth and provides a spiritual compass to ensure we do not go astray from being Christ centered. Though experience validates our faith, it is the word of God, the Bible, that establishes our faith. There are many aspects to our relationship with the word of God, the Bible, which are essential for us to develop into spiritually minded Christians. Previously, in part three, we established the reliability and the authority of the Bible. In part four, we looked at the word of God as spiritual water in terms of the labor, which both cleanses and refreshes. In part five, we looked at the word of God in terms of the table of showbread, the bread of life. In part six, we studied how to handle the word of God properly. And this week, we're going to explore how to develop into spiritually minded Christians in relationship to the word of God, the Bible. Through receiving God's word, we're born again, declared righteous, and thus justified having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. However, however, once we receive Christ, our relationship to the word of God doesn't end. It actually just begins. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul noted that God's word builds us up, provides us a blueprint for living, and promises us the full inheritance that God is offering all his children if we're sanctified. Receiving the full inheritance requires sanctification. Justification positions us to receive the inheritance, but sanctification qualifies us to receive it as we submit to God's word. In Psalm 119, verses 101, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. For any healthy relationship to develop, one must have a respect for the other party. It is not any less true in developing a healthy relationship with God and his word. If we're not familiar with God's word, we'll never learn to love and cherish his word. You know, as believers, we need to learn how to honor God's word. Sometimes there are things we read the Bible we just don't like, and so we ignore those things. You know what we're doing? We're actually dishonoring God's word. We cherry pick what we like and what we don't like. 
And you know, and non-believers aren't stupid. You know, they know some non-believers know a bit about the Bible. And when they see Christians acting in ways contrary to the Bible, they go, "Why should I believe what you're saying? You don't even believe what the Bible says yourself." Unless we read God's word, we are in fact ignoring God. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Our relationship with God's word not only reflects how much we value God, but it also has a direct impact on the level of intimacy and friendship we will be able to develop and experience with Christ. If you want to develop a very deep intimacy with Christ, you need to develop a great intimacy with his word. In John 10, 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Some Christians complain, I have never heard God's voice. The truth is that if true faith has sprung up in your heart, and you've responded to it by repenting and putting your faith in Christ, then you have heard his voice. I remember before I was a believer, I first of all started hearing the gospel. I first of all thought it was just foolishness. Then a few years later, as people were praying for me, and as I kept hearing the word of God, hearing the gospel, something within me was stirring that there's some truth behind this. But I still wasn't saved. And then a couple years afterwards, that I, I put my faith in Christ, and all of a sudden, there was really, I knew this is true and I knew he was my savior. So if, you, if, if faith is sprung up in your heart, you have heard from God. If you responded to God, you have heard from him. Now, sometimes, I mean, how many people here have ever actually heard an audible voice of God speak? Could you put your hand up? There's one, two, three, there's, I mean, we're seeing, we're hearing, I don't know, there's about 20, 25 people who have an audible voice of God. Last night, we had about 60 people. I'd say we had about 15 that actually heard the audible voice of God. I haven't. I'm sort of a meat and potatoes Christian. You know, just straightforward. But, I mean, but it's not like you hear his voice all the time. But there'll be a moment or two in time where God will speak to you audibly. And, and some people in this room have heard the ex- audible experience, audible voice of God. And some of us who haven't say, God, why don't you speak to me? He, he does speak to us. He does speak to us. If you hadn't heard his voice, you wouldn't have come to Christ. And he still speaks to us. Jesus calls both Jews and Gentiles to himself the same way by speaking to their hearts. Other sheep, I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So God speaks to everyone. And those who hear and respond in faith become his children. Jesus Christ says this about himself. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, how does God reveal this truth to us? Jesus answered that question with these words. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So we see that it's the Holy Spirit that reveals this truth. The next logical question we should ask is, how do we ensure that what we are actually believing is the truth and is not some subjective interpretation of people's opinions? The most foundational way, uh, the most foundational way the Holy Spirit speaks to us is through the word of God, the scriptures, which is our measuring rod for all truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your Your word is truth. So so we see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit is the one who speaks to us, and he speaks to us primarily through the word of God so we can know it's truth. And many times God leads us, and we we have a sense of what God is showing us, and that's wonderful. Even even God can lead us through through different, uh, different gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the primary way that we know what God is really saying is the Holy Spirit uses the word of God. 
The Holy Spirit can lead and direct us through the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, everything that we receive, whether by revelation or by teaching, must be tested against the word of God. We must ensure that it is the Holy Spirit who is actually speaking and that we correctly understand what we have received. These, this is from Acts 17, 11. These people were more eager, these people were more willing to listen than the people in Thessalonica. The Bereans were eager to hear what Paul and Silas said and studied the scriptures every day to find out if these things were true. And even when I teach on a Sunday morning, it's your responsibility to go into the word to make sure that what I'm saying is true. It doesn't matter. I'm a pastor. It doesn't matter. Every, everything we test is according to the truth of the word of God. We need to be willing to test prophecy. Sometimes people have a prophetic word and they go, oh, God said this. No, you need to test it against the word of God. And many times people don't test the prophecy. And so what? They end up ending up listening sometimes to imaginations or people saying things, trying to make it a prophecy. But in the word of God, there are clear tests to know if the Holy Spirit is spoken or not. But that's a whole different topic. One of the primary ways that God speaks to us is through his word. Sometimes Christians grumble, why doesn't God speak to me? The answer is simple. He wants to, but we need to be willing to listen by developing a relationship with the word of God, by reading the Bible daily so we can hear him. Sometimes we see Christians falling into error of lifestyle and it appears that God says nothing to warn them. When their lives begin to fall apart, they may initially even plead ignorance, saying, God didn't warn me about the bad decisions I was about to make. See, they're expecting for someone to come up prophetically and say, Thus saith the Lord, stop committing fornication. Thus saith the Lord, don't keep stealing from your boss. That saith the Lord, stop lying. And they go, well, I went to prayer meetings. I went to church. God never spoke and told me that I, I was wrong. I mean, there are people come to church sometimes and they're living in fornication. And they're saying, well, I'm here and God has never corrected me. So I can't understand why my life fell apart now. However, God has already given us his word, which fully instructs us in godliness and warns us about the destruct destructiveness of sin. Our part is to open the Bible and begin to read it and obey it. You want to know it's wrong to commit fornication? Just read the Bible. You don't need some vision. You don't need some prophecy. You just need to open the word of God. It's not theologically complicated. 1 Samuel 14, 37. So Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down with the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. And also in 1 Samuel 28, 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Why is it that God did not answer Saul, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets? Because Saul had rejected the word of the Lord. God, God stopped speaking to him through prophets and in dreams. This does not mean that God did not want to speak to Saul, nor does it mean that God had nothing more to say to Saul. However, to hear God, Saul needed to turn to the written word of God. There is no indication that Saul studied and meditated or even read the scriptures. And based on his later activities, it is evident that later in his life, he never actually even read the scriptures. Saul's sinful decisions and disobedience continue to increase and the consequences of those decisions continue to grow, all because Saul ignored God's word. He continued to make worse and worse decisions. Eventually, he even consulted a witch for direction. This last sin resulted in his death. 
God's word is very clear. Just because God hasn't spoken to you prophetically to rebuke you or to warn you doesn't mean that what you're doing is right when you know it's already wrong according to the word of God. Saul was asking the wrong questions. Saul was seeking God about how to fight the Philistines, but what he really needed to know was how to get his life right with God and back on a course of godliness. For Saul to hear from God, he needed to go back to the word of God and read it, study it, meditate upon it, and above all, obey it. Through his word, God would speak to him about all he needed to know to change the course of his life. If Saul had begun to turn back to the word of God, his life wouldn't have ended tragically. His life would not have ended tragically. There was consequences of his sins, but through the word of God, God would have brought restoration to his life. See, we read about Saul and say, well, that was evident. that He was on a collision course because he couldn't change now. That's not true. If he turned back to the word of God, God had much to speak to him about where he could change, where he could repent, and how his life could be restored. Before the Holy Spirit will lead us in the specific decisions we need to make in life, we need to first study his word and hear what God wants to say to us about how he wants us to live. You know, people will pray and say, God, where do you want me to live? But they fail to ask God, how do you want me to live? They're thinking, I don't want to miss God. I want to make sure I get the right apartment or I get the right house or I get the right job. They're asking those questions, but there are things in their lives that are contrary to the word of God. And God doesn't lead them because he's wanting to speak to them about things that are much more essential, about having a right relationship with God. Nehemiah 13, 26 says this. Did not Solomon... King of Israel, sinned by these things. Yet among many nations, there was no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused, him, caused even him to sin. See, King Solomon is an example of one who is beloved by God, but failed to heed the word of God, resulting in disastrous consequences. You look at Saul, I mean, I mean Solomon, and you see that God loved Solomon. He says he was beloved of God. He was beloved of God, but his life ended in disaster. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, 1 Kings 2, 1 to 4, now the days of, days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to to their way, and to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David's last instructions to Solomon began with the words, Prove yourself a man, which could accurately be translated, Become a man. In other words, grow and mature into a true man and prove yourself to be a godly man. In other words, grow up. You know, we can be grown up physically, but be immature emotionally and spiritually. And so what is, when he says, prove yourself a man, grow up into a man, what's he saying? Live godly. Live godly. When we live ungodly, we may be mature outwardly, but we're immature spiritually and emotionally. King David, Solomon's father, gave Solomon the key to becoming a godly man and to live a fruitful and victorious life, a life in which his relationship with God would flourish, 
I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do, and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me. David gave Solomon the solution for every problem and challenge he would face. Read, study, and meditate upon God's word. Be diligent to walk in God's ways. Keep its statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, and all that is written in the law of Moses. That's what he said. Just do this. He just said, just do this one thing. Study the word, and you will begin to grow and be established. If Solomon had been diligent to keep the word of God deep in his heart, he would never have strayed. Do you get that? If you're deep in the word, you will never stray. He would have avoided uh, making foolish decisions, and his love for God would have continued to grow and blossom as he contemplated how wonderful, holy, just, and loving God is. You know, people who are in the word and, and prayer don't one day fall away. Never happens. What happens, they stop reading the word, they read it less and less and less, they pray less and less and less, and pretty soon they begin to doubt, or pretty soon they just begin to stray and make wrong decisions. It's not like if you're in the word and prayer and you're seeking God and you're in his word, you will never go astray, you will never be brought to a place of confusion about what is truth. The first time God appeared to Solomon in a dream, early in his reign, God expressed his love for Solomon and promised to give him wisdom, riches, and honor like no other king in his time. God's words ended with this exhortation. If you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. The most startling thing about Solomon's first encounter with God through a dream is that he was not confronted about his first grave error, which was marrying not only a Gentile woman, but the very daughter of Pharaoh. You get that? I mean, there it is, this Jewish king who now goes against what God's word says, and he not only marries a Gentile, he marries the daughter of Pharaoh from the country where they were delivered from, from bondage. As we would say in Yiddish, that's Meshika. It just is crazy. What is even more startling is that when God appeared to Solomon a second time in a dream, after he had finished building the temple in Jerusalem, God did not directly address the things in Solomon's life that were leading him on a very destructive path. In this dream, God clearly points out the conditional blessings he had for Solomon. Solomon's blessing was conditional on his obedience. I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you've made before me. I've consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I've commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. However, unlike the first dream, God clearly warned Solomon of the dire consequences if he failed to obey his word. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. God told Solomon that if he chose not to heed his warning, he would still use Solomon and Israel as a witness of his righteousness to the nations. However, instead of being an example of the blessings that result from obedience, they would experience the consequences of disobedience. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, 
Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. At this point in Solomon's life, he thought he was still doing well. He had just completed building the temple in Jerusalem. His kingdom was prospering, and he was the envy of all the kingdoms around him. Yet he was blind to the direction his life was taking. Despite his service, he had no viable relationship with God or his word. It's very sad that Solomon's life became an example of what not to do instead of an example of how God blesses when we do. It's so sad. It is so sad. But, you know, Solomon was, so there it was, the first time God appeared before him and, and said how much he loved him. And then he didn't say to him, but listen, why, are you, how, why have you married Pharaoh's daughter? What are you doing? He never said that directly. The second time, after he'd been starting to collect all these wives, Gentile wives, Again, God appeared to him and even gave him a stern warning that if you follow me, everything is great, but if you don't, it will cause destruction to you, to your family, and to your kingdom. But why didn't God say to him, thus saith the Lord, what are you doing marrying these strange wives? The reason is, God already had said it in his word. And so what did God say over and over again to Solomon? Read my word, study my word, obey my word, obey my statutes. It's already there. It wasn't like God had to repeat himself. God is speaking so loud through the scriptures. He's speaking so loud through the laws of Moses. He is speaking so loud. And so he's saying, just open it and read it. How could he have ignored it? The only way I can see is he stopped reading the scriptures. He stopped reading the scriptures. And he's saying it was not a big deal. You know how sometimes you see Christians, at the beginning they have a real sense of what's right and wrong according to the word of God. But after a while they, they stop reading and say, well, that's not quite clear anymore. I go, what's not quite clear anymore? <laughs> it's, it's ambiguous. I go, what do you mean it's ambiguous? There's only a few verses that say that. What do you mean there's only a few verses that say that? In other words, do you see the point? Is if Solomon continued to read the word of God, he would have been convicted. He would not have been able to continue marrying those Gentile wives and he would have put them away. He wouldn't have allowed them to influence him. He would have said, this is wrong. But he kept the word of God closed. And because of that, when God came to speak to him, he didn't say to him, he didn't repeat what he already said. He goes, read my word, obey my word, and you will prosper. For believers, Solomon's life serves as a warning. Just because we are being blessed at the present time does not mean that everything in our hearts is right, or that our lives are perfectly lined up with God's word. It is a sign that God loves us and is seeking to encourage us to get us into his word and hear his Holy Spirit so we can correct those things in our lives that need to be changed. Only then can we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes people say, my life's going okay, so everything must be fine then. Everything must be fine. But there could be things in our hearts. Unforgiveness, bitterness, lust, anger, whatever it is, selfishness. Things that, not that we're struggling with, things that we've embraced. Things that we say, it's okay. It's okay. Maybe you're watching things you shouldn't be watching. Maybe you're reading things you shouldn't be reading. Maybe you're listening to things you shouldn't be listening to. And you go, well, God's blessing me. Everything's fine. Nobody came up to me in church and said, the Lord showed me that you're doing this and this and this. So I must be okay. Life's not fine. If you're not in the word, reading it and studying it, meditating on it and obeying it, you're on a collision course for problems. You are on a collision course for problems. Because if you're not reading the word of God daily, you're not going to remember, oh, wow. So if you have, let's say you, have, you're, you, you walk into church, you see somebody that you're upset with. 
and that springs up with you. Well, if you're in the Word, you realize, uh-uh, I got some unforgiveness there. I got some bitterness there. So what do you do? You go to God and say, God, right now I just confess this. I thank you for forgiving me, and Lord, I just want to be cleansed from this. In other words, you deal with it. See, in our home, garbage day is once a week, but spiritually, garbage day is every day. Every day. But you need to be in the Word to know when you're having garbage in your heart. You know, it's not wrong. I mean, garbage is part of this life. It's wrong to keep the garbage. Right? So as soon as you recognize there's a wrong attitude of selfishness or pride or whatever it is, you just say, oh, this is wrong. And you God, I just confess this. I don't want to own this. I don't want to hold on to this. I confess this, Father. Just thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for forgiving me. I just want to walk in a, a heart that is holy. And as you do that day by day, he will begin to change and cleanse your hearts and your lives. How many Christians, even those in ministry, have ended up spiritually shipwrecked? Why? Because they didn't stay in the word of God. You know, sometimes you can have a person who preaches the word, but is not in the word, and then his life falls apart. You go, what happened? Because he didn't have a relationship with the word of God. He just was up there speaking it. But he wasn't actually studying it and letting it speak to him. I like that point. I'm going to write that down. Simple steps in developing a relationship with the Word of God. Read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate on the Bible, memorize the Bible, speak the Word, pray the Word, obey the Word by applying what you have learned, and share with others what you have learned. So those are steps that how we develop a relationship with the Word of God. First, the first step in developing a relationship with the Bible is to simply begin reading the Word. You know, when I first came to Christ, 40 years ago. I remember the guy who led me to the Lord. He was a believer a long time. It was two years. He had been a believer two years. And you know what I was amazed? I was so amazed that he actually could take the Bible. He could open it up. He could find something. I go, how'd you do that? The book's this thick. And he could open it up and he could find something in it. I was astounded. I go, that's amazing. How'd you know it was there? How did you know it was in there and how'd you know to find it? An average English translation of the Bible is about 750,000 words. 750,000 words. That's equivalent to the complete works of William Shakespeare. Could you imagine somebody says, oh yeah, William Shakespeare said this, and turning to one of his many plays and turning to the page and saying, there's where it is. You go, wow. So I remember when I first heard that, when he first started showing me that, I go, that's amazing. And I thought to myself, I could never know the Bible the way he knows the Bible. He could actually open it up and find something. You know, I didn't even know what books were in the Bible. Forget, I couldn't even name the books, let alone what it actually said. I remember when I met Robert Ewing uh, 23 years ago, and uh, we sat down, we spent six days together. I flew down to Texas, and he spent five days teaching me the Word of God. Five days. 10, 12, 14 hours every day. And I remember they were taking notes. I, was take, I got the binder still. That was the foundation of what I understand about the word of God. I spent five days taking notes, taking notes, taking notes. 10, 12 hours a day. You know what was really amazing about those five days? The only thing Robert had was a Bible. He didn't have one note in front of him. Not one note. And I thought, how could he do that? Well, guess what? I can do that now because I've been reading the word. You know what I mean? In fact, my wife says, I don't know when to stop. <laughs> I just talk and talk and talk. I was actually, a few years ago, I was in a Bible school in Switzerland, and uh, they had me teach one day. They had me start at 11 o'clock in the morning and end at 9 o'clock at night. Just one break for lunch and one break for dinner and 10 minutes between lectures. So I came out alive, but some of them came out dragging themselves. <laughs> But the thing is, as we begin to read the Word of God, as we just begin to read it, you know, for those who've been just reading it, all of a sudden you, you know the Scriptures. 
by simply reading the Bible, we will develop an overall view of the word of God and a working knowledge of what is written and where it is located. This isn't unique to me. If you have been reading the word of God for any length of time, it's already getting in you, isn't it? It's amazing what happens just by reading it. You know, what I do in my devotional life is I like to spend a bit of time reading some of the New Testament, a bit of my time working through the Old Testament. I like to read a few Psalms, one or two Psalms. And I just read. And you say, well, do you understand everything you read? I don't understand everything I read, but I just read it. But I've been doing that for 40 years now. But even after the first year, even after the first year, all of a sudden, I had a working knowledge of the Word of God. Even after one year, I had a working knowledge of the Word of God. Right? I mean, it doesn't take 30 years. Within months, within months, as you slowly just work your way through it. And I always, keep, I always read the New Testament, and I like to read a bit of the Old Testament and a bit of Psalms. That's how my, I would never just say, just read the Old Testament. You always want to stay in the New Testament, which keeps us focused on Christ, and it is a measuring rod to know how to understand the Old Testament. But the Old Testament in, uh, causes the, the New Testament causes the Old Testament to blossom with all sorts of treasures. So just read the word. And that's for all of us. I remember when I first heard this guy go, I could never know the Bible the way he knew it. Well, because I'd never read the Bible. But as I began to read it, all of a sudden it just becomes evident. And I think many, many, many of you understand what I'm saying. Right? It's just, it's there. The next step in developing a relationship with the Bible is meditation. That is where we just park ourselves on a specific scripture and spend time pondering and thinking about its meaning. We can meditate on a scripture by simply rereading a verse over and over again and allow its truth to impact us. In other words, you know, sometimes I feel like anxious. You ever get anxious, right? You just feel anxious. And so what I do is I'll just open up a scripture like Philippians 4, where it says, be anxious for nothing. I'll just take that verse and I'll begin to read it out. And I'll keep reading it and reading and let the truth of trust in God. Or other scriptures in, in 1 Peter where it talks about, about not being anxious, right? You know, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Just, but I, I don't just say it. I, I like to read it. I like, and as I'm reading, I go, oh, God's faithful. You know, it's amazing. I've been a believer like 40 years and I still have to remind myself, oh, God's faithful. Isn't that amazing? But if I'm not in the word of God every day, I can forget that very quickly. I can forget that very quickly. So every day as I'm reading the word, I remember, oh, God is faithful because I'm reading his word again. We can also meditate on scripture as we are praying and worshiping God. And I love doing this too. You, you know, when I'm spending time praying, especially praying in tongues, but when I'm praying and worshiping God, I'll take one scripture, one truth of who God is, and as, I, as I'm praying in the Spirit, in my mind, I'm going, oh, praise you, you who created the heavens, you who stretched at the heavens. And I'll just begin worshiping in that one area that God stretched at the heavens. He took space and time and he stretched it, and I'll begin to worship him. Or I'll worship him when he said he created all things visible and invisible. I go, wow, and I'll begin to worship him. Praise you, Lord, that you have created all things visible and invisible. You are the creator of all things. And I'll, I'll begin to worship him. Or sometimes I'll spend time just thinking about he who dwells in eternity. That means he who dwells outside of time and space. And I'll begin to worship him. You who are timeless. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Praise you, Lord. And I'll begin to meditate upon those scriptures. The Alpha and the Omega. The one who dwells outside of eternity. And so that way I'm also meditating on his word. And then Sunday mornings for those who when we come we have our pre-service prayer, and you probably see me going around making all sorts of noise. You want to wonder, what is Howard thinking about? Well, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm just spending time in the beginning just worshiping God. And as I do, there is such a joy that springs up in my heart to recognize how wonderful and how loving God is. Number three, another important way to develop a relationship with the Bible is to spend time studying it. This is where we begin not to only study the context of specific verses, but also to understand how they relate to other scriptures. Studying the Bible is like digging deeply to mine out treasures. You know, I remember it was, it was December 1994. We were in a prayer meeting. 
Harvey, you were there with Clyde. Remember Clyde and Brother Robert Ewing was there and stuff? And Clyde Williamson, a friend of mine, he's a prophetic brother, he's praying for me and he saw a vision of me. And this vision actually discouraged me. And what he saw was, he saw me going down into a mine and coming out with treasures. Gold and silver and precious stones. And he goes, God is going to have you go into the word and bring out treasures. And you go, why would that discourage you? Wouldn't that be encouraging? And the reason it discouraged me is I thought, I don't seem to get anything out of the word. I said, I don't seem to get anything out of the word. So I'm thinking, oh, I mean, I thought that was discouraging me because I'm reading the Bible, but I, I'm not getting anything. I remember one time I tried to, to do a study a few weeks before that time. So I took the Greek word euios, which means mature son, and I went through my concordance and found every place in the scriptures that Greek word is used. All 10 million places, right? There's huge, like maybe 50, 60, 80 spots. And I looked at all the scriptures, I wrote them all down, and I go, what does that mean? What does that mean? I go, and so I felt like, God, how can I get anything out of your word? I can read it, but how do I teach it? How do I get revelation out of it? I felt so discouraged. But you know something, three weeks later, the Lord started this, this Bible study became this church, January 15th, 1995. And I remember I was challenged. This brother said, the God wants to start a Bible study. It'll become a church. And he says, he's going to give you a revelation. You're supposed to tape your message. I tape my messages. What would I want to tape them for? <laughs> and so I felt, and so finally I was praying and praying, and all of a sudden one theme came up, something that Brother Robert taught me. So I remember teaching that. And I thought, wow, that was great. Well, that's the end of my ministry. That's all I've got, one message. <laughs> I got one message only. I remember the second week I was praying and all of a sudden another scripture that came to me and things that Robert taught and all of a sudden and I started teaching it out. And I remember the second week Jim and Jeannie were there. And I remember, you know what I taught on? I taught on the table of showbread. I taught on the tabernacle, the table of showbread. And I remember Jim came up to me with tears in his eyes. And he said, with weeping, he said, he said Howard, I've never heard grace taught in such a way in my life. And I go, I was teaching by the table of showbread. But anyways, <laughs> remember that, Jim? 21 years ago. But you know what I recognized? Is don't get discouraged. Don't say, well, I'm reading a word. I'm not getting anything out of it. I, I'm not getting it. Don't stress out. Just read it. And then... When something touches your heart, just study it. Don't say, well, i got to learn something now. Just saying, sometimes, sometimes when I spend time meditating or reading the Bible, something jumps out at me, and I'll begin to study it in greater detail. Right? So I'll just read something and go, wow, I wonder what that means, or I never saw that before. Well, then make note of that, and later on, just start studying it out. Either studying it in terms of the, the context of the scriptures, or finding other scriptures that will actually elaborate and bring it together. In other words, don't try to say, oh, I've got to have some deep revelation. Just enjoy God's word. And when God speaks to you, because when you're reading the word, something will touch you. Then God is begin to speak to you. David said this. I think it's Psalm, was it 61, where he says, 61 or 62, where God said, David said, God spoke once, but I heard twice. God spoke once, but I heard twice. Many times God speaks three times. Nobody's listening even once. But what he says is, what does it mean God spoke once but I heard twice? It means that when God spoke to him, he stopped, he took note of it. He began to meditate upon it. God spoke once, but he kept hearing it over and over again as he began to meditate and think about those things. God, if you are born again, and when you read the word, God will speak to you. And when he does, you'll know that because oh, something will touch you. Go, that's really good. Or that, what does that mean exactly? Or that encourages me. Or many times God speaks in questions. So we can inquire. In 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Studying the word of God is rightly dividing the word of truth as we seek to understand the whole counsel of God. I like to read the Bible not only in one translation, but sometimes I use different translations to kind of get the feel of it. And even if you want to, it's helpful sometimes just to get some language aids, uh, Greek, Hebrew, and, and uh, Aramaic lexicons. 
And, you, and now with computers, you can, within a few minutes, you can learn how to press a button and it'll, it'll actually give you the Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic meaning. So it's a quite, and then with a little bit more study, you can even learn about the, the grammar. But even if you don't want to learn the grammar, you can at least go back and know what the original words are. It doesn't take much time. When I first began, it was like I had these big lexicon things, right? This is before computers. I know some of you don't believe that I'm that old. But anyways, um, thank you for that. And those who do, I don't want to comment. But anyways... Um, but the thing is, but now with, with, with these computers, there's even free programs where you can, you can actually get into the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic to say, oh, that's what that word really means, to get a real flavor of what it is. So that's all you do, just read through those things. Developing a doctrine around one individual wor- verse, divorced from the rest of Scripture, can lead to error, which will produce either legalism or license for sin. One of the foremost hallmarks of healthy doctrine is the centrality and the preeminence of Jesus Christ. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are, were created through him and for him. Another key for healthy doctrine is this. Can you hear Jesus saying those words? You know... So the thing is, the first is the centrality of Christ. The second thing is, when you read something and it comes across very condemning and very harsh and very hopeless, then you're saying, I'm not quite getting it. doesn't mean Jesus can't be stern sometimes, but it's always with the aim of redemption, salvation, restoration, if we'll listen to those words. So if you're reading something and you can't hear Jesus saying them yet, then you need to realize... I still don't know what that verse really means. I'm not getting it yet. However, for us to apply this test correctly requires us to truly understand the heart of God and to know Jesus Christ intimately. We come to know Jesus better as we read, meditate, and study the scriptures. As you read the gospels, as you read the New Testament, you begin to know the heart of Jesus. You begin to know his love. You begin to know his boldness. You begin to know his holiness. And as you do, you begin to recognize his voice you begin to recognize his voice. In Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Uh, I remember a a number of years ago, Leonard shared this with me, and it was really precious. It says, "Who, uh, who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And Leonard had a problem. He was really concerned. I'll share this. His concern was that he was loving his wife more than he was loving God. Maybe he was loving his wife too much. So he was really troubled. God, I want to make sure that I love you above everything, but I'm loving my wife more. I'm loving, I'm loving my wife a lot, and maybe my what, love for my wife is going to get interfere with my love for you, because i got to love you more than anyone else. And he was really concerned, and he was praying about this, and God spoke to him. And this is what the Lord said. You don't love me more by loving others less. You love me more by loving me more. I'm going to say that again. You don't love me more by loving others less. You love me more by loving me more. See, legalism says we need to love others less. Isn't that what legalism? I've seen people destroy relationships saying, I think I'm loving you too much. I've seen people break up relationships saying, well, I don't think we should get married because we love each other too much. You ever heard people say that? I've actually heard people say that. You know, that's also another Meshiga statement. But anyways, (laughs) but the point is, so legalism says love others less. And you see, legalistic people are angry and harsh because they don't hear the voice of Jesus. Will Jesus ever say, don't love your wife or don't love your husband or don't love your children so much because you're loving them more than me? See, license for sin would have us love many things before God. But grace says, You do not love God more by loving others less. You love God more by loving God more. In other words, continue to love your friends. Continue to love your spouse. Continue to love your children. Continue to love your friends. But now, love God even more. In Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Jesus said to him, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When we love God more, it actually causes us to love others more. When we love God more, it actually causes us to love others more. Two foundations of godly character are love and holiness. The word of God says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And, but as he who is called, call, but he, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. A good way to test the health of our doctrine is by gauging the development of love and holiness in our lives. As we read, meditate, and study God's word, we can begin to understand how much he loves and cares for us. Your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than could be numbered. Our response to God's love is that we will increasingly, increasingly love him more. We love him because he first loved us. People say, well, I don't, I don't sense God loving me. Well, as you start reading the word and reading and understanding what Jesus did for us, understand the tenderness of God. Even the Old Testament is really filled with much of the tenderness of God. And as we read that, it touches us. And our response is we love him more. We love him because he first loved us. So if you don't feel like, I'm not loving God, I'm not loving others, and I don't feel God's love, as you get into the word, you go, wow. Thank you, Lord. There are things that when you read the word, just touch your heart. Oh, God, you are... I like it. To say, it doesn't say that God loves. It says God is love. God is love, and God is holy. When we study the Bible, we need to do it exegetically and not eisegetically. When we study the Bible, we need to do it exegetically and not eisegetically. Exegesis is derived from two Greek words, meaning ex, meaning out of, and eisegesis, which means to guide, thus allowing the scriptures to guide and speak to us. In other words, when we do it exegetically, we say, God, let your word speak to me. The opposite of exegesis, to draw out, is eisegesis, which is to draw in, in the sense eisegetical commentator imports or draws in his or her purely subjective interpretations into the text, unsupported by the text itself. Eisegesis is often used as a derogatory term. So in other words, when we study the word exegetically, we let the scriptures speak to us. When we study it eisegetically, we're trying to make it say what we want it to say. All an exegetical study of the Bible is where we try to bring all the relevant scriptures together and allow them to speak to us. An eisegetical method excludes those scriptures that seem to contradict what we want to believe. You ever had it where somebody wants to be argumentative about the Bible? Yeah, I know you've never met anybody like that, but I'm just saying hypothetically. <laughs> and you know what you'll do is they'll say, well, they'll have one saying this is... This is, uh, this is what the Bible teaches. And they'll be really adamant and say, yeah, but that verse says this, but you think you're understanding that verse correctly because what about these other verses? And you know what they'll do? They'll ignore the scriptures that you pointed out. No, 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 no. And they'll just jump. They'll, they'll, like, they'll jump and they'll not address those other scriptures. That's eisegesis. They're trying to make the scriptures say something. But exegesis is saying, let's take all the scriptures and pray, God, show me how they all fit together. You know what's amazing? And this is another quote from Leonard. He says this, if you read two scriptures that seem to contradict, you know what that means? It means you either don't understand one or both scriptures. That's true. There are times where I've been reading the Bible, and these seem to contradict, and then years later, sometimes months later, but sometimes years later, all of a sudden they go, wow, they dovetail together. They dovetail together. In other words, if you're saying that they seem to contradict, it doesn't mean that that they do, it means I don't understand them yet. It's God's way of saying, wait. It's God's way of saying, wait. I'm going to write this point down wherever I am now. I'm going to try to figure out where I am, and I'm going to write that point down. See, I know none of you take notes on myself, but I like my sermons, so I'm taking notes. (laughs) 
So there, there is what we hear, and then there is what we want to hear. Exegetical says what we should be hearing. Eisegetical is what we want to, what we want to hear. We don't want to muzzle the word of God. We don't want to muzzle the word of God to try to say something he's not saying, but let God speak to us out of scripture. When studying the Bible, it is okay to acknowledge when we still do not yet understand a certain scripture, because for we know in part and we prophesy in part. It is much better to be honest and admit we still don't have clarity on a specific scripture, instead of trying to force to say something that it may not be saying. You know, people think, wow, you know so much about scripture. There's a lot of scripture I don't know about. But the reason you don't know I don't know about them is because I don't talk about them. Because why would I get up on a Sunday morning and read a scripture that I have no idea what this means? <laughs> Make a very boring sermon. And there's another one I can tell you I don't know what it means. <laughs> what I do is I share the things that God has made clear to me. <laughs> you like that, Leonard, right? <laughs> okay. If we don't have clarity or revelation on a certain scripture, we need to set it aside and wait on the Lord until we get the proper understanding and revelation of it and where we can hear Jesus saying those words. Memorizing God's word can take a number of forms, but the result is, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Again, I was speaking with Leonard, and he says, you know, he talked about the importance of memorization. I said, well, when I was a new Christian, I tried memorizing scriptures, uh, it was a little bit hard for me to kind of, you know, get all the words right, and, and I would just go over and over and over. So I, I said, I, I don't do that anymore. He says, yes, you do. I go, what do you mean? I says, well, when you're speaking, you're always just, well, scriptures are just coming out of your mouth without even just flying into your mouth. I go, yeah. He says, so what I realized is that there's different ways that we memorize a word. Some people will take it and just actually mess it, memorize a passage, which is totally fine. But there's other ways too. When we have God's word hidden in our hearts, it is so strongly ingrained in us that the Holy Spirit can easily bring the appropriate scripture to our mind whenever we need. Right? Have you noticed that? Many times when we speak together, we're in the men's Bible study or whatever, what, the men are getting up and they're saying scripture. Right? They're just, they're, they're maybe not, don't get the address, but they're quoting scripture. They're, they're just reciting things just out of their heart, just coming right out. What have they done? They've been mes- memorizing scripture. Right? We'll get into discussion many times, and we'll have like 30, 40, 50 men on the men's meeting, and as we're talking, men will get up and just, just share something and share scripture here and there. They, they don't even have the Bible open. Just, it's coming out of their mouths. Why? Because they've memorized it already. It's in their hearts. Memorization of the word of God can happen very naturally simply as we continue to cultivate a relationship um, with, the, with, with the word of God through reading, studying, and meditating. When you're reading the Bible, you're actually memorizing it. When you're studying the Bible, you're actually memorizing it. When you're meditating on the Bible, you're actually memorizing it. You don't realize it, but you are because you're reading it. You, you know how many times you're reading the Bible and you already anticipate what's going to be re- read, what you're going to read next, right? Isn't that true? How many of you say, yeah, that's right. It's not like you read this, wow, I've never read that before. You've read it time and time and time again. But it's not boring. It's exciting. And you're anticipating. And then as you read it and you're anticipating, all of a sudden you go, oh, that's what that means. See, now it's coming alive to you. The first time you read it, you're just trying to get a landscape of what's going on. But as you go over it month by month and year by year, it starts to, to, to come alive. It starts to take shape. Some Christians misunderstand how we are to co-labor with the Holy Spirit. They think that God will do it all with no preparation on our part, on our part is required. This is simply not true. You know, some people think, well, if God wants me to preach one day, I'll just get up there and I'll just flip the Bible open and, I'll, and the Holy Spirit will just give me the words. He could do that, but he will not do that. Prophesying, he does that way. Word of knowledge, he does that way. But when we are to minister the word of God, that does not happen. There is preparation. When Jesus came into the synagogue to proclaim that he was the Messiah and to begin his public ministry, he acted very deliberately. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, 
And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written about himself in the book of Isaiah. Do you know, there was, it wasn't like Jesus that on that day, they, they gave him the scroll of Isaiah and he goes, okay, Lord, what do you want me to read today? No. He went and he began, he got the scroll and he began to turn and turn. He knew exactly what he was looking for. He knew exactly what he was looking for. When Jesus taught from the word throughout his whole ministry, how did he know that? He spent his whole life reading the word of God. He, be, he spent his whole life studying the, the law and the prophets, the writings. He knew it all. He developed as a man even though he was the son of God. And that's why he could quicken, be quickened by the Holy Spirit to know what to say and when to say it. He wasn't stumbling around saying, I, I think it's located somewhere here. He knew exactly, I think it was a scroll too at that time. Can you imagine a scroll? It's not like turning the page. It's like, whoops, 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 you're going through that. But he he knew exactly. In other words, if you want to be used by God, you need to be in his word. It's not like you're going to go, oh, yeah, I'm just going to, the Holy Spirit just told me the scripture. No, what he does is we put it deep deep in our hearts, and when it's deep in our hearts, then the Holy Spirit brings it out to us. The preparations, we put it in our hearts and the Holy Spirit brings it out. You know, people say, well, how do you prepare your sermons? You know, my sermons got a lot of scripture, a lot of scripture. And the way it does is I'll spend time praying and the people who know I'm always praying, I'm desperate, Lord, let me hear what you want me to speak this week, right? Linda and Don and the elders and other people, Jim and Jeannie, you know, they're all, you know, they're all, we're praying, I'm praying, God, I need to know. And then all of a sudden, I, I really like it when it happens on a Wednesday versus a Saturday morning, but um, since we have a Saturday night service. But anyways, and all of a sudden, it comes alive. Something comes up. I may not know it all, but I got, I got the theme. But then as I pray and start studying, and I study at one scripture, all of a sudden, another scripture comes to mind, and another scripture comes to my mind, and another scripture comes to mind, and one by one, they start coming out, and I just, they just start to feed together, and it's like a line of scripture that all lines up. But you know, that's not just because I'm hearing from the Lord, it's because God is using those things that have been in my heart to bring them out. Now somebody asked, how much is God and how much is you? I said, I don't know. If I say it's all me, nobody's going to show up. And if I say it's all God, that's too proud. So I just don't know. That's why you have to test everything. But the point is that it's the scriptures that are deep in our hearts, they, the Holy Spirit brings them to the surface. In Matthew 13, 34 and 35, and all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. When we read about Jesus teaching in parables so that the multitude would not be able to understand, it begs the question, why? Why would Jesus teach so they didn't understand? My goal is to teach so you do understand. When Richard Dawkins, a famous evolutionary biologist and militant atheist, was asked what he would do if he met God after he died, Dawkins replied by quoting Bertrand Russell, another famous atheist, Sir, why did you take such pains to hide yourself? I think God's reply to Richard Dawkins is obvious. Why didn't you seek me when I called you? And of course the answer is, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The answer to the question as to why Jesus taught in parables is very clear. He simply revealed the meaning to those who truly wanted to know. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him knocks it will be opened. If you ask and seek, God will always answer. God will never say, I'm not going to answer you. In Mark 14, Mark chapter 4, verse 10 and 12, 10 to 12, but when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. But to those who are outside, what was it? It was the 12, it was the apostles, and others who came afterwards and said, what does it mean? Why were they outside? Because they didn't want to come inside. 
They just didn't want to come inside. That's why they're outside. And so what we can do is, if we just ask, he will answer. Anyone who wanted to know what those parables meant would have known because they would have come to Jesus and asked him, and he would have explained. Also, Mark, Mark 4, 33 and 34 uh, gives the same thing. It says, and when they were alone, he explained all things to them. And when they were alone, when you are with God alone, say, God, I'm going to wait on you till you explain this, he will explain it. Jesus expounded on the meaning of all his parables when he was alone with his disciples. The disciples were the only ones who stayed behind to ask what the parables meant. Jesus never rebuked them for their questions. He always gave them the interpretation and the understanding. And the disciples desired to know what the parables meant, and they were willing to spend time with Jesus to hear the answers. Explain to us the parable of the tares. And when Jesus taught about his return, they responded by saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? In other words, they said, tell us these things, and he told them. I want to share with one last thing, and we're closing. I had a scripture that for many years I didn't understand. And it's in Romans 10, verses 4 to 10. It says this, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. As with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, I get a lot of it, right? You know, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you're saved. I, I get that. But for many years, I could not figure out verses 6 and 7. They were puzzling to me. Because what does it say? It says, faith does not say who will ascend into heaven. That's to bring Christ down. And faith does not say who will go into the abyss. That's like bringing Christ up from the dead. I go, what? Now, maybe you guys are smarter than me, but I didn't get it. I just said, that makes no sense. Faith does not ask who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. And faith does not ask who will go into the abyss to bring Christ, that's like bringing Christ up from the dead. Now, did you ever get that? Like, doesn't that seem like, what, what's Paul saying there? What is Paul saying there? And so many years, but one evening, this is about maybe 15 years ago, one evening, in literally a blink of an eye, I received some insights in the Romans 10, 6, and 7. This is what happened. I was actually, like what I do is I read, read, like to read the Bible in the morning, and that's my time. I really spend time in it. But at night, I like to go to bed. You ever like to snack at night? Well, I snack on the Word of God. So I like to just you know, sit there and just maybe spend a few minutes reading it, just to have some thoughts about God as I go to sleep. Well, one night, I remember I was lying in bed, and I was reading, and I just happened to be reading Romans 10, and I came to verse 6 and 7, and I'm there, and I'm out, kind of nodding off almost, right? You know, one eye starting to close a bit, and I'm reading it, and all of a sudden, my eyes flash open, and I go, wow, I know what it means. Now, I didn't go to any commentator. I didn't spend, uh, you know, trying to dig deep into it with a lexicon or anything else. I just, it's all of a sudden, one moment, it just came to me. I go, whoa. And it's like this. Faith does not ask, who will ascend up to heaven? That's like bringing Christ down. You know what it's like saying? It's like saying that somebody is good enough to get saved without Jesus. It's like saying Christ's righteousness is being brought down to the level of man. You ever meet somebody, oh, I think that guy gets saved because he's really nice. When you do that, you're bringing Christ's righteousness down from above. Christ is in the heavens. His righteousness is above. Our righteousness is nothing. So when you begin to look at somebody, I could see that person getting saved. You are doing that very thing, thinking there's something good in themselves that will help them get saved. That's reducing Christ's righteousness. It's bringing him from down from above. And if you look at somebody and say, that person is so bad, he's going to go to hell no matter what. That's like bringing Christ up from the dead. It's like saying Jesus never died for that person. It's like saying, he never died. It's bringing him up from that, not resurrecting him, bringing him up from the dead, saying, for that one, Jesus did not die. The two lies that Romans 10 dispels, some people aren't broken, and some people are too broken or evil to be fixed. And the two truths that Romans 10 drives home, we are all broken, and we all can be fixed. So simple steps in developing a relationship with the Word of God. 
read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate in the Bible, memorize the Bible, speak the word, pray the word, obey the word by applying what you have learned and share with others what you have learned. I know it's been a long message. I'm sorry. Let's pray. We're going to stay now. We're going we're to have one more worship song before the prayer team comes forward. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, Father. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you are good and you are faithful, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we're just so thankful for your love and your faithfulness, Lord. And help each one of us, Lord, to be faithful to study your word. I thank you, Lord, that we are all in need of hearing your voice. But I thank you, you're generous to speak to us all so wonderfully, Lord. Thank you. I thank you for the people you've spoken to, even with audible voices. Isn't that amazing, Lord? Thank you for the people you speak to through visions and dreams, Lord. Thank you so much for all those, Lord. But I thank you above all, you speak to all of us through your word, by your Holy Spirit, as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Father.